released, but it would take up the whole afternoon session. So, well, a wonderful poster round. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to my fellow judges. Wonderful. So um, we move now to really think about the role of psychiatry in medicine more widely in Oxford, um, both in terms of education but also um, within the local NHS and research. And it's a great privilege really to be standing here as someone who trains here and wouldn't be standing here had I not met many of you actually here in the audience who very much influenced the decisions I subsequently made. Um, so we've got, I'm very mindful of time, we've got quite a few people to get through, so it gives me um, great pleasure to introduce Professor Mayo, who's an undergrad here at St John's College and qualified in medicine in 1965 and specialised in um, psychiatry, returning to the department in 1973, and in fact I think he previously did the role, had the role that I'm now in today. And his clinical work um, and research has been concerned with the psychological consequences of major physical illness and with unexplained uh, medical symptoms. He's actually the founder of what we now know as the uh, Royal College of Psychiatry's um, Faculty of Liaison Psychiatry, and he's also a fellow of Muffield College. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce him. Training in psychiatry. 
a remarkable creation of its uh, Sir Aubrey Lewis and others. And I got there, having worked at Hammersmith and the Bronson Hospital. I was enormously impressed with the Wolsey Hospital in those days. The other thing that was going on was that academic medical departments were being founded in teaching hospitals. And that was especially true of psychiatry departments, where newly appointed professors, mainly in Moynesley, were setting up departments. Unfortunately, they didn't have the resources to do much more than teaching and clinical work. So Oxford was the right place. And it was the right place because the Regius Professor of the day, Sir John Pickering, set out to overcome the indecision and create a new sort of medical pool in which research would be fundamental. He wanted to exploit the very considerable assets of the world here. <coughs> and this included the prospect of a brand new hospital and the Meyer House site in Headington. And in fact, planning of the maternity hospital, the first bit, began in 1968. Sir George saw psychiatry as a priority, joined the five Nuffield departments of medicine and so on, and eventually obtained funding from the WA Hansen Trust for the chair. And he was able to offer a temporary building and a staffing equivalent to the five Nuffield professorial departments. And then the right person, Michael Gelder, was a Maudsley and Institute Psychiatry Consultant, I think of outstanding intellect, clarity of thought, and drive, together with some remarkable organisational skills. He'd been very much involved in MRC-funded pioneering research on behavioural treatment. He certainly shared with the Maudsley view that psychiatry is an integral part of medical sciences, and also what was Nearly as usual at that time, he was convinced of the importance of clinical psychology as collaborators. Uh, Michael, as many people here recall, was uh, not a man of small talk when he was about the department. He was fairly chilly and indeed some found him uh, intimidating. And I used to say about him if Michael has a heart, it's in the right place. <laughs> and it was. And I have to say uh, that there was, of course, the other Michael, who we didn't see walking around the department, was a man who, amongst his friends at his Italian class at Merton College, uh, was entertaining, relaxed, interesting, a different person. And I have, in the last 15 years of retirement, enjoyed many lunches with Michael, and I found him extremely agreeable. Indeed, I found myself looking forward to lunching with him uh, in those days. And I think it's um, sad that the outstanding psychiatrist of generation never received the public recognition he served. I think the right person. One should also say that Michael was very good at attracting the right people. So this <coughs> one person who managed to gather around others who were able to create the department we have today. I'm not sure what package of sport Michael extracted from Oxford University. Certainly it included priority in building, in getting a new building. He made himself, I'm clear, very aware of the great unexploited potential of Oxford medicine. But he also knew that the two psychiatric hospitals were not distinguished did not communicate, and had some pretty significant personality issues. <laughs> um, Michael brought with him two very talented policy colleagues. Dennis Gaff, who arrived on the first day, was highly gregarious, a former Oxford clinical student, and was able to bring invaluable local knowledge and contacts. John Bancroft arrived a little later. And when I arrived in 1973, the five-year-old department was well-established, familiar to me in style, 
and already much bigger than any other teaching hospital in Parliament. And if I just list um, some of the things Michael and others have done, that they had expanding buildings with expanding staff, research established with the MRC program uh, for psychological treatment. They were involved in a laboratory at Littlemore in an unused psychiatric ward. There was also research starting on this very site here. They set up a program for medical students. It was entirely independent of the medical school. We never in those days saw the director of clinical studies of those days. Uh, it was done entirely by paperwork passing to and fro with the tiny medical school office in which uh, the secretary of medical school uh, was helped by the splendidly named Mr. Tidy and Mr. Messer. <laughs> <laughs> um, then the rotational training scheme was <coughs> organized and then Catherine arrived was about to take on the demanding task of getting a senior registrar rotation. It was a clinical service at Warnford Hospital that also was a very special effort to establish a clinical service led by John Bancroft <coughs> to work here in the outpatient department of the Burberry and a consultation service. I want to come back to that. And finally, Michael established uh, lots of working relationships locally within the NHS. There was the really redoubtable and remarkable uh, medical director of the Regional Health Authority, Rosemary Rue, who I think was enormously helpful. And she was the creator of uh, schemes for uh, married women doctors, which I think be, were very considerable. So they were enormously helpful to us. Uh, Michael was involved in the MRC, and then was welcome, and especially <coughs> after 1986, that welcome managed to become much wealthier than it had been previously by its activities on the stock market. Uh, Michael was then involved there. So he, though he always seemed to be in the department, rushing through one's door, taking door hinges, he in fact was in London round and about establishing all sorts of working relations. I want to say a bit about psychiatry and Oxford medicine. I think two themes there, really. Psychiatry is a, as a medical subject, collaborative research by many or most members of the department. Um, if you uh, look at the first edition of the Oxford text of psychiatry, published in 19, which Michael Dent and I wrote entirely. It does, I think, give a view, it's a Maudsley view, it's an Oxford view of what psychiatry should be about. Um, of course, we don't have to go to the text of psychiatry, you just look at the list of things of these two days that show that so many of the topics involve the whole range of the medical sciences. So, that collaborative research for the whole department. And then there's what uh, Michael Sharp and I like to call psychological medicine, uh, which is a special research of clinical interest. When John Bancroft arrived to set up things here, consultation, informal consultation was well known in the teaching hospital, certainly. But the idea of or organized service, and the idea of research was new. There wasn't any research really before then. And it began here then with a consultation uh, team uh, based somewhere over at Mal Malton Street, which is where I was pointing to over there. Um, a broom cupboard of a hutted ward down there. And consultation and uh, especially what in those days we call <coughs> suicide. And that clinical service very quickly was accompanied by various pieces of research of which the outstanding one was the attempted suicide program that continues. 
and uh, it was involvement with um, that service and the job that changed Keith Horton's life forever. <laughs> um, and it, uh, it also affects on quite a number of us in other ways. Um, and um, so if I you know, list topics that we've involved in search in the early years, it includes cancer, heart disease, road accidents, functional unexplained symptoms, including <coughs> Glycology, uh, perinatal problems, childhood epilepsy. There's a long list of things which are matter in the search here. And I think the research the computer said, did achieve national and international reputation at the time that this sort of liaison to power satellite was really very unusual within British psychiatry. And indeed, the Royal College group, as it was then called, uh, was something we launched at the Royal College meeting here in Oxford, John Radcliffe, in 1983, with a small number of people. And uh, it has, I'm very pleased to know, it's grown enormously since then. And Oxford has been always involved, not always uh, easy, um, had problems on the way of various, various types but I think it is a considerable achievement that still stands. <coughs> the last thing I want to talk about <coughs> is psychiatry and the development of Oxford medical sciences. In 1969, Richard Doll was appointed a professor of medicine, and he immediately started Saturday morning planning meetings, I think in his own home, with a very small group of people. Um, Michael, from the beginning. Also, the key people, I think, were the, uh, Nuffield professor, the new Nuffield Professor of Surgery from 1972, Peter Morris, and the new Nuffield Professor of Medicine from 1974, David Weatherall. And this small group planned how to turn uh, this relatively modest clinical enterprise, uh, together with the much bigger pre-clinical setup, into an internationally distinguished research medical school. <coughs> it was planned by them, and they started setting priorities and raising the money. I think probably the chair of pediatrics was the first outcome, but the corporate grass in 1972 was the, the Rhodes Professor of Clinical Pharmacology, and David Graham Smith was appointed. And the collaboration between psychiatry and clinical pharmacology is one that, of course, has been enormously fruitful. Uh, what we see today in terms of the massive medical sciences arises, I think, very much from Richard Doll's vision drive and the way in which those he worked with all agreed with and supported this vision. Michael Gelder, at this time when Richard Gelder was up, was strongly supported by people here for election to the Regis chair, but in fact this never came to anything because the actually conceptually Darwin Street and other sorts of country is not an appropriate subject for a Regis professor, and instead elected uh, pathologist Henry Harris, who uh, was one of the less satisfactory <laughs> professors. Um, Michael continued to be very active in medical sciences. He chaired the Planning and Development Committee of the Clinical Medicine Board in a magisterial manner. I was also a <coughs> member in his latter days, and uh, it was an impressive performance. And the then secretary of the medical school, the feisty James O'Noon, told me that uh, when she had a telephone call from Professor Gilder, she trembled at what she was going to say. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a formidable performance. Alongside one or two other formidable uh, medical personalities. So, psychiatry had that other role in this, I 
the astonishing creation of the Department of Medical Sciences. Those of us who are around some while ago uh, think it's unrecognizable from what was on this site. Tiny parts of medicine, very little clinical research. It is a great achievement and to country. And members of us were involved right the way through in achieving that. So I believe that psychiatry uh, here has been integral to medical sciences, biological sciences indeed, and including clinical psychology from the beginning, and this has been enormously fruitful. It had an extremely good start in, under its first term. <coughs> chair of psychiatry. But my story, I can take only to uh, 2013 when I retired from my university post in 2015 when I retired from various medical science and university committees. So that's a while again. There are other people here speaking who also have long, a uh, great deal of knowledge of uh, oh, this department of Oxford medicine from. Uh, various standpoints, but there it is until 2000, until you go. Bye. Thank you. And um, we're going to move on to um, Professor Sharp, who's going to bring us a bit more up to date. Um, he was also a clinical tutor and previously um, in the role that I'm um, in now. He studied experimental psychology at Corpus Christi College here before uh, studying medicine in Cambridge. Um, and then moved to Edinburgh for a while to a personal chair before returning to Oxford. And he is the professor of psychological medicine here in the department. I'm the trust lead for psychological medicine at Oxford University Hospitals um, Trust, and his research is uh, aims to understand the psychological aspects of medical conditions. Thank you very much. I'm struggling with this. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Um, So I'm going to be old-fashioned and uh, use some PowerPoint slides. Uh, and I want to uh, build on and elaborate what Richard May was saying, and I want to focus more on what psychiatry and <coughs> psychology has done within Oxford medicine, as in medicine practice in the hospitals. Um, I want to just put it in context. Let's, it's only a 50th anniversary, let's put it in context. This is Oxford. The medical school, if you believe the university website, is not only 900, but nearly, um, nearly 1,000 years old. Um, and of course, we see this iconic picture for the medical school, which as you know is the Radcliffe camera, called the Radcliffe camera because it was built with money from a physician called John Radcliffe. Um, so who was John Radcliffe? So John Radcliffe was, uh, as you could only be in the day, he lived from 1650 to 1714, he managed to be a physician, an academic, and a member of parliament. Um, he also managed to make an awful lot of money by being a physician to royalty. And uh, he's important to our story because as well as building the Radcliffe camera, his estate endowed the General Hospital in Oxford, which is, of course, called the Radcliffe Infirmary. And as Richard said, with much greater knowledge than me, you could possibly locate where the various words wards were, because this is exactly where we are now. The Radcliffe Infirmary, we're now back about 250 years, opened in 1770. And uh, we know that hospitals in those days were probably rather less discriminating of who they took in, and the infirmary would take people with a whole range of problems, some of which we might now call psychiatric. But of course, there wasn't psychiatry then to differentiate. So 
So go back now 200 years ago, <coughs> the trustees of the Radcliffe Infirmary built way out in the country in Eddington, the Radcliffe Lunatic Asylum. <coughs> and uh, one of the members of the board of the infirmary, called the Reverend Walford, who apparently made his money by marriage, um, gave a lot of money to the hospital. And so as happens, the name of the hospital got changed to the Walford Hospital. So as you see from that history, we, we do have a legacy with psychiatry being created in asylums here and in most parts of the Western world as being quite separate. And so we develop these concepts of physical illness and mental illness. We have these parallel worlds. So how does this go for psychiatry in Oxford medicine? So this is where we pick up the story of the birthday, the 50th anniversary. Now, of course, that building wasn't there 50 years ago when, as Richard described, Michael Gelder and his colleagues arrived. Um, but, of course, the university was in a very good position to be able to uh, do something about the separation between psychiatry and medicine. And, of course, around the time that the Department of Psychiatry was established, the new hospital, as Richard said, was being built in Hennington. Quite ironically, really, as it happened in other cities, the, the, the general hospital was in the centre of the city, the mental hospital was built out of town, and then the general hospital later comes to join it. So although it was closer, as you know, it's still a critical 25 minutes walk away. And there's a problem with that. <laughs> because if you happen to need both psychiatric care and medical care, you have a degree of separation with an optimal place somewhere probably on the London Road. So, so, so that is a challenge. And as Richard said, the university, uh, right from the start of the university department, had a major role in doing something about that unhelpful separation of the physical and mental. So uh, here we see with, with the beard there, John Bancroft, and on the other extreme, Dennis Gath, and in the middle, Michael Gelder. Uh, and those were the three founding members of the department. Michael Gelder always thought of himself very much as a physician as well as a psychiatrist. John Bancroft, as we hear, started work in self-harm. And Dennis Gath was interested particularly in the psychiatry of gynecology. Uh, Richard uh, uh, came a little later, as we see, when John Bancroft left and developed broader interests in medical care. Keith Horton, who's here today, uh, has key to developing the uh, psychiatry to the emergency department, particularly in self-harm. And one of the few known pictures on the internet of Chris Bass, <laughs> Chris was one of the several physicians, including Ted Smith and Elmer Feldman, who staffed the psychiatry department, which developed at the John Ratcliffe's called the Barnes Unit. So we can see that academic psychiatry, aided by NHS psychiatry, had a really important role in making a place for psychiatry in general medical health care and in bridging that gap. But that gap was still a gap. Um, even though there is a building on the site, it is physically separate from the rest of the hospital. And the term that was around for this linking between psychiatry and medicine was liaison. A liaison officer, you may probably don't know, a liaison officer in the army is the officer that runs between the forces to coordinate their efforts against the energy, and the enemy. Uh, and so this was very much liaison. <coughs> so that's a, a, a very proud background going back to 1969. But as the years have gone by, the world has changed. We have got older. All of us, but also the population has got older. The type of patient coming into medicine that we see now is certainly very different than they were when I was a, a, a medical houseman. The average age of medical admissions to the John Radcliffe is about 83. 
Most of those people have multiple conditions. And you can see on the colored graph there, with age along the bottom, and percentage of patients with multiple disorders on the side, you'll see that um, something like all, this is the primary care, this is not hospital. In primary care, you see as you get older, people are more likely to have multiple medical conditions. And in the other graph, you see uh, on uh, my left-hand side, your right-hand side, is the risk of having a mental illness plotted against the number of medical conditions. They're called physical health disorders. You see there's a linear relationship. This particular graph is divided up to show the effect of socioeconomic status, which is another factor. But basically, if you, this is in primary care now. So if you go into hospital now, you get a distillate of this. If this is the lager, what you get in the hospital is the straight scotch. You get people with multiple medical conditions with a very high prevalence. If you include delirium, dementia, as well as anxiety, depression, PTSD, substance misuse, a very high prevalence of psychiatric disorder. So that historical separation has become more challenging for the general hospital to deliver care. So then we have uh, another step building on the previous steps happened uh, around uh, 2012. And this step actually was initiated by um, people in general healthcare. So you'll see there um, on your left, Paul Brennan, he was a chief operating officer of the, of the OUH at the time. <coughs> On the other side, on the top, the other extreme, is uh, Stephen Richards, who was at the PCT. And of course, in the middle, who's going to speak later, David Gerard Caldicott, who has been on the board of the trust for 17 years and the chair of the trust for 10 years. The figures on the bottom are John Reynolds, Tim Pito, and Hal Jones. And these are all senior physicians in the trust. The reason I'm showing these people is they, they weren't obviously members of the Department of Psychiatry, but these were the people that were key to bringing psychiatry into OUH and embracing it as part of medical care. So if you like, we're almost going to circle round to the old Royal Infirmary where we don't differentiate psychiatry as separate, it's part of the medical enterprise. And so if we jump forward to today, um, that is some, I'm sorry a lot of people are not on there, it's one of these difficult photographs like we had yesterday here, yeah. but that's some of the, the staff that now work in Oxford University hospitals, there are about 16 psychiatrists, consultant psychiatrists, and over 40 psychologists, and some other uh, allied health professionals as well. And this is, they're working in what fits the needs of multimorbidity, a different way of working. They're working in an integrated way. <coughs> Pit crew. Don't, probably many of you are motorsport fanatics. This is the crew that when the racing car comes into the pits, that is tires change, possibly to be refueled. They're the guys that do it. Do you know how quickly they can change the tires on a car now? Two seconds. <laughs> Two seconds. So the point about this, I could use this as an analogy, it isn't original, I thought Gwandi used this, as a metaphor for modern medicine. It's fast. You have to deal with complicated stuff, and you have to work as a team. These guys are exquisitely practiced at working as a team. They all have very specific roles. One guy does the fuel, one guy does the left-hand front wheel, one guy does the right-hand front wheel. They're very specific roles working together. That's what modern acute medicine is. It's team-based. So if you want to alter the care of patients, you have to be on the team. There are a lot of teams uh, in OUH. Uh, this is part of the continually changing uh, diagram of the hospital. But we have psychiatrists or psychologists in about two-thirds to three-quarters of those teams. So we don't have a separate group of psychiatrists and psychologists who go and visit the teams. They work as members of those teams, whether that's neurology, children's uh, acute medicine, 
oncology, renal, ITU. Uh, uh, we haven't just anyone in radiology. Um, but there's, there's someone in nearly all the teams. So that is the new approach. And the aim is, in this journey that was started back when the department started in 69, to link psychiatry, to keep psychiatry as part of medical care, is to really mix it right back in so that we have something approaching full integration. Uh, the trust um, dignified these efforts last year uh, at the Oxford Psychological Medicine Centre, and this is important, and John Guinness very kindly came along to the opening deck here and opened it. Uh, this is important because it brings together psychiatry and psychology service with the research endeavour we're going to hear more about and the teaching, which we're going to hear more about. So, um, just to finish, uh, I think this integration that OUH has achieved, building on the early days of the department, has been very successful in building care around the patient and really giving parity of esteem for their mental health needs as well as their physical health needs in a real way, not just a token way. I think. Dave Kernan might say more about this. It's changed how people in the hospital think about mentally ill people. And I think from the point of the university department, it's created great opportunities for teaching and for research that we'll hear more about. And this success has been acknowledged by the Royal College, the King's Fund, the Care Quality Commission, and NHS England. Thank you very much. the success of the department in the context of sort of three things really, which are education, clinical service and research. And we're going to hear about each of those uh, separately uh, now. And it gives me um, great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Catherine Soyles, who's the Director of Clinical Studies, who's here in person now, having to send letters up the, up the hill. Um, Catherine's a rheumatologist, trained here um, in Oxford for clinical training, and did a bit of neuroscience along the way, I discovered. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about psychiatry in the, the role of, um, or in the context of um, Oxford Medical School. Thank you. yesterday, but it is wonderful to be here this afternoon. And I feel a complete fraud, if I can start with a disclaimer that is that. Um, not because I'm fessing up to some sort of quasi imposter syndrome, although I do have that too, um, but because I'm speaking really on behalf of Kate's success. And the medical school owes a huge amount, both to her and to several people sitting in this room and people out uh, in, the, in the beyond about how well psychiatry is taught within the medical school that it's primacy and you will see some of the uh, influence and impact of that culture within this school uh, in later slides. Um, I don't need to explain to this audience why there is a need to teach uh, psychiatry to our medical students, but it does speak to the history that Richard outlined and then the developments um, of the input in psychiatry and medicine as a unified subject that Michael's alluded to because of all medical conditions, psychiatric ones, are tipping the top of the post um, with uh, the global burden of mental disorder increasing. Um, I've only got data up to 2010, but I suspect if you look beyond that, it's increasing even further. Uh, and suicide, Keith is in the audience somewhere. I saw him earlier, lovely it was to see him again. Um, it's responsible for a million deaths globally each year. So it's absolutely vital that our students are well rounded and experienced in the nature, etiology, and treatment of these conditions. Um, but really, until they meet fifth year, they're not. For those of you who aren't familiar with Oxford training, I, I may, the rest of you who know about this can sort of doze gently, but just to tell you about Oxford training. So it's, it remains a very classic two times three year course, with the first three years being heavily biomedical science related. Now, of course, neuroscience plays a big part in that, and there will be elements of psychiatry and psychology embedded within that, but it's not demarcated as a separate subject. 
At the end of those three years, which are spent very much down here and then down Park Road, they come up to the hill for their clinical training, which takes a further three years. The fourth and sixth years are general medicine and general surgery and some special study modules and things around that hill. But it's really only the fifth year where psychiatry takes its strength. But that is to, not so that it doesn't appear in fourth year. In fourth year, because of precisely what Michael has alluded to, the students do have increasing exposure to psychiatric and psychological morbidity within the general medical population, but they don't have specific necessary teaching uh, within that context. So when do they get it? Well, they wait until fifth year, but then in fifth year they have a dedicated standalone eight-week course. Um, and we've always given a sort of primacy to psychiatry and to a number of other medical disciplines in that way in fifth year. We haven't threaded it through the whole of the three years, and you can argue the toss about whether pedagogically that's the right thing to do. I think our view <coughs> remains that if you circumscribe subspecialities and assess them as they go along, students get a not only a breadth, but a depth of understanding, which I think is probably not possible if you try and do a more thematic approach. So, during fifth year, the students spend eight weeks in psychiatry. Our firms are growing. It's currently 27 or 28. Um, but there are some variability in numbers. Psychiatry, for example, hosts a number of elective students because its success is well known. So students will ask to come in, and Kate will accept them if there is room to fit amongst, amongst the other students. One of the great things about the eight-week attachment is that students are embedded for four weeks in two separate clinical attachments. They do have some choice in that. There's a ghastly thing called the student medical student ballot, which is fiercely contested amongst the students, and we try to ignore it. Um, but they are, in some way, able to specify either location for those who have care and responsibilities and need to be close to the city, for example, or subspeciality. So if people are particularly interested in child and adolescent mental services, for example, or psychiatric, they may well be able to pick those. The fabulous thing about the, the breadth of opportunity is that each consultant might have only one or two students. And that is the ratio that is unparalleled anywhere in the, mess, in the rest of the, in the medical training. I mean, general medical firms are usually seven or eight, possibly more. To have one to one, let alone one to two, is totally exceptional. In terms of teaching, so there's very much that cognitive apprenticeship model, but alongside that there is much more formative and, and uh, didactic teaching in the forms of tutorials, which again are very, very small groups, Friday lectures and, and lunchtime advanced lectures, which the students find very helpful. There is formative and summative assessment, as you might expect, but crucially also monitoring and development of professional behaviours. I'm not sure whether you'll be aware, but the General Medical Council uh, this year have brought out new outcomes for graduates uh, in terms of what curriculum, how we must map our curriculum to what the GMC expect of us. The biggest change is that professionalism is first, second, and third. It is front and center of all of the outcomes for graduates. But if anybody can sit there and has a brilliant idea of how one assesses professionalism, I'd be very grateful to hear about it. It's not straightforward. But departments like psychiatry uh, and its close liaison with the students and close, uh, close relationship with students is at the forefront of, of helping us with that. <coughs> Who are the team? Well, I'm actually going to do this from reverse order from the slides um, and uh, extend my thanks to, to Kate, really, as clinical tutor and, and director of, of the psychiatry course. She took over from, from Jonathan Price, and I'm sure you will remember. She's then be assisted by Suzanne, who just sorts everything out with a calmness that is totally extraordinary, in place of really some extraordinary provoking uh, issues. And, and, <laughs> for the, <laughs> believe it. and the facilities, facilities officer, Wayne, who, who really keeps um, all of the, the um, lecture theatre and all of the stuff available, the learning resources for students up and flowing. They are ably assisted by countless consultants and psychiatrists, plus the trainees and speciality doctors who have their own roles to play. And sometimes it's actually the trainees that you remember most. Mina Fazel uh, is in the audience today. She was my reg when I was a student. Um, although I also remember Rupert McShane. Sorry, Mina, but I do. <laughs> um, there's an undergraduate teaching committee, of course, that meets every term, and there there is student representation at every single committee. So there is feedback to the students and, and liaison back to the medical school about how the course is going. Their external examiner currently is Dr. Danny Smith from the University of, of Glasgow. 
So how is this run? Um, well, it's done by a collaboration, particularly what Richard had alluded to was developing, and then Michael uh, continued uh, just a few moments ago. So we liaison very closely between the University Department of Psychiatry and the local Mental Health NHS Trust, and that partnership is absolutely crucial to the quality of the teaching, and we must do everything to preserve that. Obviously, the main partner would, is the Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust, OHFT, that has 20 to 23 placements in, in Oxford and Bucks. Milton Keynes, although it doesn't sort of fit the geography for our purposes, does fit within training, and, and that's where they go for forensic psychiatry, which remains one of the most popular placements. Um, recently, we've had an increasing number of students involved in OUH Foundation NHS Trust with liaison and ED services, and that speaks to, to Michael's great developments in, in the Department of Psychological Medicine. So this is all very well, the course is up and running and runs splendidly, but how does one know that it runs splendidly and what quality assurance measures are in place and more importantly what feedback do we get? But what matters? What matters in terms of feedback? Is it how the students feel? Is it the numbers who become psychiatrists? Is it the numbers who win prizes, etc.? Well it doesn't matter which metric matters to you. I have to say psychiatry is probably at the top of each and every one of them. So the teaching assessment is very well received every, ter every term um, at clinical tutors group. We go over um, feedback and assessment and annual course reports. And of course, we need to say Kate was recently, she wouldn't mention this, but was recently nominated as teacher of the term. I'm going to spare her blushes by not quoting um, the denominations from the students, but they're still simple. Um, the key areas, I think, that set psychiatry apart from other disciplines within the medical school are um, particularly the first one, where 82% of students either agreed or strongly agreed that during the course I received meaningful feedback on my day-to-day -day performance. The next closest to hit that, I won't even mention what subject they are, they're down at 45%. So you are approaching double the performance of any other discipline within the medical school, and for that I am eternally grateful. And if I, well, I know how you do it, because you've got one consultant and one or two students, that's what makes the difference. Um, 79% strongly agreed or agreed that the assessment is appropriate to the learning objectives. There's a constant pressure to try and match the curriculum to what we examine. But then, very importantly, almost 90% strongly agreed or agreed that they received appropriate support as and when I needed. And that is, again, another sort of 10 or 20% above the next nearest <coughs> hitter. And that speaks not only to the characters that the deliver of the course, but the closeness of that supervision. This is just in tabular form, um, and we won't go through each of the years um, in, in isolation, but it just gives you a sense of the strength. This is out of five. We, we uh, tied it down into a, a grade of 0 to 5. And you can see that you are comfortably full or above across the years reliably, with occasional blips that vary according, I think, more to student cohorts than actually anything within, within the uh, training environment. And the placement feedback is also strong and identical. It's we're slightly worrying when you're running a course or trying to oversee a course that there's one place that just isn't managing quite as well as the others, and then how do you handle that? Is it a staffing? Is it the resource? Is it the subject itself? What, what's going wrong in that area? And yet, across all of the placements that we have in psychiatry, we don't need to worry about any of them, which makes me groan with a sigh of relief. Student quotes. Um, I'm not going to read them out to you because I think you can all read them yourself. Um, but I do think um, I've never felt so welcome before. I think it's got to be one of the take home messages. It's very hard for students sometimes in a clinically pressured environment to feel like part of the team. We are struggling, Michael alluded to the increasing age of our inpatient population. Our substrate for teaching is changing. <coughs> our patients are older, they don't stay as long, they're multi-morbid and frail. And coming, somebody coming in with purely ischemic heart disease, or purely schizophrenia, or purely something upon which you can teach them with that sort of clarity is very difficult. The staff looking after them are stressed and pushed. And to give students a home despite that, I think, is enormously valuable. Um, it's also interesting that I think you're the only department that contacts students about emotional resilience. The only other place that I think does it with any formal mechanism is the emergency department, because of course the type of things that they will see there with trauma calls and so on and so forth. But that's a different form of emotional resilience, as I think you'll appreciate. So the students love it. Um, so the students love it, the feedback is excellent, the placements are good. What about at a national, uh, at a national level? Well, there's always complaint that there aren't enough psychiatrists, 
but it can't be levelled at Oxford. This is the rate of national recruitment admittedly for the last six years. We haven't got up to date data yet. Uh, and Oxford is right at the top in pegging order with Keele and way, way ahead of many of the other research intensive universities. Just put a little match down there. It's <laughs> 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 at so the bottom end uh, of the same spectrum. I don't know why that is. So in terms of national recruitment, we do far, far better than we should do for the size of our school. Also, bear in mind we're a very small school, so we punch well above our weight. What about confidence? Earlier on, before the before students have decided even to go into to psychiatry or specialist training, in F1 confidence, they're confident not only in a chronic in an acute setting, but also in management of chronic mental health conditions. So they're skewed definitely towards the, the green and, and, and away from the disagree, um, which is really, really encouraging. I think um, most of our students are quite comfortable dealing with acute physical illness because they've spent a lot of time on taking ED, but seeing acute psychiatric um, or other mental health conditions, I think, has scared them historically. But that, there's, that time is changing. We've gone. <coughs> oh, Max, I've deleted you, but well, I haven't deleted you. Do you know how I go back a slide? By any chance? Go the other way. Oh, my hat. There we go. There we are, Max. I did promise. So, um, in terms of national awards, um, Max won the uh, Royal College of Psychiatry Medical Student of the Year in 2017, about which we were absolutely delighted, and he was a very worthy recipient. But, you know, a one out of 150, 154, 156 isn't, isn't that much to think about. But when it's also followed up by six Royal College of um, Psychiatry Foundation Fellowships, a Pathfinder Award, and four um, academic foundation placements within psychiatry, then we're starting to get many swallows making a summer. And uh, psychiatry is one of those departments that just feeds into the academic, clinical academic pathway very successfully. So is it all good news? Um, well, no. There are challenges. Uh, there are challenges currently and, and challenges ahead. And I think the most important thing is trying to maintain our status now in the changing and challenging environment is going to be difficult. It's not only the enthusiasm and the skills of the tutors who run the psychiatry course, but it is the low ratios of, of staff and student numbers, and that makes a huge difference. The school may be expanding to 100 students per year, even 200 medical scientists division making a real push to expand us up to 200. Um, and in that environment, maintaining our sounding and spacious placements, where students are still one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one with themselves, as opposed to four or five, it just is going to become increasingly difficult. There's also a flavor that trainees are also somewhat less inclined to teach. Um, NHS trainees, we rely on core, core trainees and then later specialty trainees, often cite service pressures and a slight lack of support from their clinical directors. There is a sense that you should be in clinics in the same number of patients and clinics won't be cut, allowing for teaching commitments and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's a problem across the board. I think we all struggle with that, um, but it's having its impact in, in psychiatry as well. From an academic perspective, it's lovely to have Chris Pugh here from, from Lucas. Often academic trainees will step in and will do teaching. It's part of their ACF or, or CL role. Um, but understandably, they will also cite research pressures and, and focus on publication and grant success. And that sometimes the teaching can start to, to nudge out those other, those other foci, and, and that remains a problem. So what are the solutions? Well, um, I only propose one or two. If you have any others, then do please either let me or Kate know. I think one of the most useful things that we can do, and I'm grateful to Kate for piloting something that we hate to roll out across the trust, is actually setting up and updating service level agreements for a commitment from the trust to deliver the teaching that the medical school requires. So much of this is done on goodwill. So much of this is done on, well, I'll stay late, or I'll just overlook it, or I'll do. And actually, sometimes money does speak. And we need much, much more visible remuneration to clinical directors and to the divisions so that they recognize um, the, the commit, teaching commitment that, that their staff has. There is also buy potential to buy out trainees' time either from the deanery and form clinical teaching fellows. Something along those lines is going to happen with general practice, the ring fence teaching time for GP trainees. Um, and I'm in dialogue with Chris and Denise Best at Luke about sharing some funding. 
um, between the medical school and, and UCAS for, for some of the academic trainees and buying out some time from the ACS and ACLs to ring fence around, around teaching. If any of you have any other ideas, then I would be only too grateful to hear them, and you can buy, by any means email me uh, or speak to Kate. And thank you very much for having me, and Kate and all of your team, thank you very much for running our Sandy course. Thank you. very much um, indeed. We're going to move on to think about the role of psychiatry in the clinical service, and it gives me, um, I got it the wrong way around. Ah, apologies, research first, then we move on to the clinical service. I'm very sorry. <laughs> so it's been a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jane Walker, who many of you will know, um, she trains in medicine in Edinburgh before specialising in psychiatry and has um, spent a lot of time working with patients with cancer and other life-limiting um, illnesses and currently sees patients up in Sobart House. And um, she's going to talk to us about the home study which she's leading. Thank you very much. I'm quite sure I can get this. Okay, does that work? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to talk about an example of some collaborative research between Oxford Psychiatry and Oxford Medicine. And as Kate said, I'm going to talk to you about something called the Home Study. And um, I could let you spend the next 10 minutes or so working out what Home stands for, but I'll put you out of your misery right now. It doesn't stand for anything. It just means home. So the Home Study is a clinical trial that we're running um, in the Department of Psychiatry at the moment. And it's a randomised trial with the aim of evaluating a new way of delivering psychiatry in general hospitals. So hospitals like the John Radcliffe here in Oxford. You've already heard from at least two of my colleagues that people who are in general hospitals these days tend to be older. So this study is focusing on older medical inpatients. And by older, I'm talking about people who are 65 and over. Now, in this day and age, we know that 65 is actually relatively young. But that's still the way that a lot of our services are set up. And um, we're funded by NIHR for this study. And uh, they think of older people as 65 or older. So I would let you blame them, those of you who are 65 and older. If you go to the John Radcliffe Hospital, does anybody here, how many people here work at the John Radcliffe or have been there recently? Quite a few people. If you go to the John Radcliffe and you go into one of our acute medical wards, so that's where people are admitted as an emergency, you'll see that the vast majority of people are aged well over 65. And that means, as you've already heard this afternoon, that many of those people, in fact, the vast, vast majority of those people, do not have one simple thing wrong with them. They don't just come in with pneumonia. They tend to come in with multiple medical problems and also psychiatric problems. So it's very common for somebody in one of our acute medical wards, for example, to come in with a chest infection, pneumonia, for example, to also have heart failure, some form of cancer, dementia, and then on top of that, because they're now medically very unwell from their pneumonia, to also have delirium. And all those things together are what we call medical psychiatric multimorbidity. So that mouthful simply <coughs> means somebody who's got an awful lot of things wrong with them. Now despite that, in most general hospitals, including the John Radcliffe, here, despite us having all those psychiatrists and psychologists that Michael showed you a picture of, there's still a low rate of referral to psychiatry in general hospitals. So in your average general hospital in the UK, we think the referral rate is around about 5%. Probably a little bit higher in places like Oxford, where there, where there are more of us working in the general hospital. But that includes all people, not just older people in the general hospital. That poses us quite a big problem. 
That means we've got lots and lots of people in our acute medical wards who are not getting good psychiatric care. They're probably, a lot of them are not getting any psychiatric care. And that has an effect on their quality of life. They've got lots of things wrong with them, and we're not really looking after all the aspects of that person who's in the ward. The other problem is that if you've got this complexity of medical and psychiatric, you're likely to stay in hospital for longer. Now, some people still think that being in hospital is a good thing. It's a really good thing to be in hospital if you are acutely unwell. If you're acutely unwell this afternoon, I will take you to the John Radcliffe Hospital immediately. I wouldn't suggest that you stay there, or in any general hospital for that matter, for a long period of time. And that's not because they're <coughs> bad places, it's not because the staff there will be in any way bad to you, they will do their utmost to look after you. But being in hospital for a long period of time, particularly if you're an older person, means that you lose your independence. You're much less likely to go home and to be able to do the things that you used to do independently. You're also fairly likely to pick up some other illnesses, so an acquired pneumonia, for example, whilst you're in the hospital. And being in hospital, having other people look after you and do things for you all the time, and you're losing your independence, often losing your physical muscle mass, means that as an older person, you can get pretty demoralized. You can get worried about not being able to go home, and at times you can get frankly depressed. So long hospital stays are not good for any of us, but particularly for older people. And of course, they're not good for our hospitals. We all know that we don't have enough hospital beds. We have bed prices every year. And the longer people are in hospital, the more that costs the NHS. And unfortunately, the NHS doesn't have all the money that we need to have. So this is a big problem, both for patients and for the NHS. And one thing that contributes to these longer hospital stays is people having this complex medical <coughs> psychiatric multimorbidity. Lots of things wrong with them. What can we do about that? Well, one thing that we can do is think about the way that we deliver psychiatry in general hospitals. Is there a better way that we can do that to try and address this multimorbidity and try and reduce the amount of time that people stay in hospital? whilst still obviously delivering good medical care and making sure that they get safe and effective treatments. So I told you that the home study was aiming to evaluate a new way of delivering uh, psychiatry in general hospitals, and this is what it is. It's called proactive psychological medicine. What is it? It's an integrated way of working so we have psychiatrists who are very much part of the patient's medical team. It's proactive, as it says on the tin. So they see all patients, they don't sit and wait for referrals. And they see them promptly. So traditionally, psychiatrists in general hospitals are called to see the patient when they're medically fit for discharge. We don't do that. Our psychiatrists who work in this model see patients as soon as they get to the medical ward. Traditionally, we're also there to look for psychiatric diagnoses. Does the person have a specific psychiatric disorder? Instead of doing that, the psychiatrists who work in a much more comprehensive way. They're doing a big biopsychosocial assessment. So they're looking at all the different aspects of the patient. They're doing that systematically, using a manual and a checklist, so they all do it in roughly the same way. <coughs> and this is pretty intensive. They don't come along, see the patient, scribble something in the notes, make a suggestion to the physician, and then go off and have a cup of coffee. They're there every single day that that patient is in hospital. And this is why they're there. They have a very focused goal, working with the rest of the medical team, to help patients get home safely and stay <coughs> home. So they work with the medical team, the patient and their family to do their best to make this happen. 
And every day, when they're there seeing these patients, they have these three questions in their mind. What are this patient's problems? What's keeping this person in hospital? And what can we do to help with that? So going back to the study that we're doing, I'm sure you know that a clinical trial is a comparison. So here we're comparing two different ways of looking after all the people in the general hospital to see if we can improve how quickly they go home. We're comparing usual care with usual care plus this new approach. Our aim is to recruit about 3,000 older medical inpatients and they'll be randomly allocated to either get usual care exactly as it normally is in the hospital or exactly the same plus this new approach for active psychological medicine where essentially a psychiatrist is on their team in an integrated way. These are the questions that we're trying to answer with this study. So if we compare it with usual care, does this new approach for active psychological medicine reduce the time that people spend in hospital in the month from, from the time that they start taking part in the study? Does it improve their quality of life? Does it improve things like their experience of their hospital stay? And is it cost effective? So how are we doing with this? 3,000 patients sounds like an awful lot, doesn't it? We're recruiting participants here in Oxford at John Radcliffe. We have a team also at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge and in Exeter at the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. And so far, I'm very pleased to tell you, as of last week, we've recruited more than a thousand patients to take part in this study. <coughs> so that's a home study, evaluating this new model of care, a new way of delivering psychiatry in general hospitals, very proactive and integrated and intensive approach I put all these names of places on here because there's an awful lot of people involved in this study. I just want to take a brief opportunity to thank NIHR for funding us, but also particularly to thank all these other organisations who are involved. And you can see here that this is a combination, a beautiful combination, of psychiatry and medicine. There are mental health trusts involved, there are acute trusts involved. There are lots and lots of psychiatrists and physicians involved in this study. I'd also like to say thank you to the, the people in our department who are working on this. So not only the people in the psychological medicine research team who work with myself and Professor Sharp, but also all the other people in our department who sometimes don't get a mention. So all the administrative, financial, and facilities people who really help us to do our job. Doing these kinds of big multi-centre studies, collaborating across lots of organisations, is very difficult. It's hard work, but it's incredibly rewarding, and we couldn't do it without them. So thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you ever so much. So I'll get, get, get things in the right order this time. So apologies uh, for that. So we're now going to hear um, a bit about the um, psychiatry in the context of um, the general hospital and, and the clinical setting. It gives me an enormous pleasure to introduce Dame Fiona Caldercott. Dame Fiona studied medicine here at St Hilda's College and trained as a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist. In fact, the first woman to be president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and its first woman dean. And um, was then uh, the chair of the National Information Government Board for Health and Social Care and until 2010 was the principal of Somerville College and as Michael's already mentioned, has been on the board of OUH for 17 years, is that right? Yes? And, and chair for 10, so it's fantastic that she's, she's here to speak with us today. Well, thank you very much indeed. And there is a disadvantage in speaking at the end of a programme. It's quite a lot of the things that I thought I might say um, have been mentioned already, but I guess I can say this is a, a personal reflection on my time in Oxford in different um, 
uh, activities, and I do appreciate the invitation to come speak at the 50th uh, anniversary of the department, the academic department of psychiatry. Um, rather a lot of years ago, I applied for a position in the academic department, and I wasn't shortlisted. And one of the things that this stage of my career has led me to do is to reflect on some of those failures going along the way. And so I've been thinking about, well, where would success in that application have led me to? And I haven't come up with an answer. But it just brought home to me that uh, it was an interesting coincidence that here I am speaking to the 50th anniversary celebration, having not made it into the staffing of the department. <laughs> it has certainly led to a long commute. Um, and as you will know, I've taken on that long commute in later years for a different purpose. One of the reasons for my choice of psychiatry as a specialty uh, is that along with primary care, when I first worked, when I qualified, is that it focuses on the whole person of the patient. So it constitutes both the fascination, I think, and the challenge of the clinical practice. One of the things that thinking about this made me reflect on is that I think some of the stigmatization that we suffer from in the specialty, not just our patients, but also we ourselves, comes from within our own profession of medicine. And you've heard some illustrations already from former speakers about it perhaps being rather different in Oxford, that there's been from an early stage the recognition that psychiatry is a specialty in its own right, offering care to people who have uh, illness of various sorts, although I was very interested in Richard Mayo's example of the powers that be deciding that we couldn't have a Regis Professor of Psychiatry because it somehow didn't come up to the same standard as medicine and surgery and some other specialties. So even at that level, I would say, of stigmatization, I'm not sure how much it's changed over the years of my career. Um, one of the sobering stories that uh, uh, I tell in this context is that when I was an officer of the Royal College and I had a, a conversation with um, the president of a very ancient uh, college of a different specialty, who asked me quite aggressively why would any of his trainees want to do any psychiatry. And I thought that question really illustrated quite a lot of, of what is a problem with some of the attitudes that colleagues have about the work that we do to help people who suffer just as their patients do. A prejudice that I thought was seriously disappointing from such a senior surgeon in this case. I hope that's changed, and perhaps in the discussion we'll hear a bit about whether young psychiatrists encounter that kind of prejudice today. I a lot fear not. Early in my time as an officer of the Royal College, I learned a lot about the difficulties of psychiatrists who treat those who are both physically and psychologically ill and the recognition that they had within the college and also within the services where they work. And that was the beginning, I think, within the college itself of much greater recognition of liaison psychiatry. I'd also worked for many years with the senior registrar in psychotherapy who was married to a GP, and I'd learned a lot about so-called heart sick patients and how difficult it was to help them, what a disrespectful epithet that is of people, again, who are suffering. So over the years, I've been an advocate for liaison psychiatry, and I think it has an enormous part to play at that interface between our work and that of all the other people working in medicine. The growing acceptance of parity of esteem is clearly something which is addressing some of those attitudes, and I think that's a, an enormously radical development, although there are clearly concerns that it's not being observed and delivered in all parts of the country. So what I would like to say about the ex experience in Oxford University Hospitals Foundation Trust is that we over recent years, and we've already heard something of this, have been developing our service of psychologists and psychiatrists to work within our acute teams, and that this has gone a long way towards illustrating why we have so much to offer in the care of those who are physically ill and who are admitted to our hospitals. We do appreciate very much the contribution to our services that colleagues in Oxford Health Foundation Trust have contributed over many years. The in-reach or liaison service has served many of our patients well. 
but you also heard a lot about how things have changed in the acute service in the time that I've been chairman of the trust. Many, if not the majority of the patients admitted to our care have complex mental health needs as well as their physical condition, of which there may well be several, and traditionally those patients have not been well cared for or managed in acute settings, and we really have tried to change that. The integration of psychiatric and psychology colleagues led by Michael Sharp into our acute <coughs> clinical teams has, I believe, led to improved patient outcomes, the education of staff in caring for those patients, as well as giving the staff support to address complex clinical situations effectively and maximize the efficiency of care. Our staff, who by and large are trained to work in acute care, often lack the skills and confidence to manage the psychological aspects of the clinical presentation of the patient appropriately. This risks a longer length of stay for the individual and a patient who is more likely to be readmitted re after discharge and hence higher costs of their care. The development has occurred against the background in recent years of increasing numbers of patients who are admitted with comorbidities, as you've heard, <coughs> rather than a single diagnosis. And the pressure on how resources are used has increased steadily during that period of time as well. Currently, I think that more than half of our medical inpatients and about a quarter of our outpatients have a psychiatric diagnosis. But I understand from talking to colleagues in the Oxford Health Trust that there's very little overlap in the psychiatric presentation of the patients who are treated in our trust and those who are treated in theirs. So a challenge for our staff is how in our setting the replication of mental and physical health care together not serving many of our patients well, has now led us to look at a much more patient-centered service and the uh, ability that we have to reduce the stigma of having a psychiatric diagnosis. A referral-based model of liaison psychiatry, however well-managed and focused, cannot, it seems to me, meet the high prevalence of need that many of our patients present on admission or in our patients. Neither can it upskill and support our staff in the way that they need to offer more comprehensive patient care. So the Oxford Integrated Psychological Medicine Service has been developed to implement and support the psychological and the psychiatric components of care through the clinicians who are part of the acute team. <coughs> this has enabled our entire teams, more than half of them, to manage the mental health component of the patient's care through participation in multiple in disciplinary discussions to advise on our patients' care and to consult on individual patients. I believe that this has changed the view of psychiatry in the acute service and has meant that our patients are receiving a really enhanced episode of care when they are sick <coughs> with various uh, morbidities. I described the success of this approach for patients and staff and it also enables research into that approach as you just heard from Jane. The challenge for us now is to replicate this across the entire trust, beyond the services that not only want more from the 50 or so psychiatrists and psychologists who employ in the current services, but those services which do not have access to such clinicians at the moment. We're very proud that the service has won a number of awards from both the college, but also internationally in Europe and in the States. And we really want to see it expand so all our services have access to this approach to care and all our patients can benefit from it too. One of the things I'm asked about quite a lot at the moment is because I leave the trust in a fortnight's time and I'm asked what I would like to see happen in the trust after I've gone. One of the things I would really like to see is that this service is extended across the whole of our caring services in, in the uh, trust that I currently chair. And I do think that this service really reflects the values of the Oxford University Hospitals Trust. Those of compassion, respect, learning, delivery, excellence and improvement, all beautifully manifested by this service. Thank you very much.
you. So we're going to move on to a panel discussion um, now where we've got three discussants and um, Professor Goodman's going to chair that. And I think they're all here somewhere. Uh, so everyone's been asked to give a brief five minute presentation. Um, and then we hope that will generate um, some discussion within the panel and then some questions from the, the audience as well. That's great. So the first person I'd like to introduce is um, Professor Linford Hughes, who uh, graduated here in Oxford and has been telling me all sorts of horror stories that she's reliving, having come back from London on the train today. I'm sure she'll say a little bit more about, about that. Um, and she heads the academic faculty of the college, so it's great to have you here. Uh, yes, I came to that panel a year ago, it was that I first started in medicine here, and um, yeah, well, let's say 40 years was quite close to the mark. And I do remember Mr. Tidy, I was um, Prof. Gelsen's medical student for a while, but because I was a bit older and I came to do medicine, he mistook me for his SHOs, which was slightly difficult because I wasn't allowed to sign any scripts at, some, at that point. But uh, Oxford has had a huge impact on my career, um, and it's actually the first time I came across Guy Goodwin, who was on the other side of the table at my welcome. Uh, clinical fellowship interview, which I finally got, got one after my second time of coming. But um, I, Oxford is a very special place, and I was sort of come back. I haven't quite ever made it back other than the lovely visits like this. So it is great to be celebrating 50 years. And um, I think what we've heard today is the immense excitement around um, psychiatry, mental health more broadly, and the overwhelming number of people who want to be involved in this area of research and activities around it. I think we are facing a time where stigma is probably reducing in the, in the public to some degree, or at least there's a greater understanding, although it is still a fight. It's very sad to see some of the comments in some of the Times uh, last weekend talking about, I work in addiction, how you know, people dependent on opioid painkillers should not, utterly inappropriate for them to be sitting next to a heroin addict. I hope that we can address some of this um, stigma further. Um, I have a role, the reason I think I'm here is, is really because I'm chair of the academic faculty and one of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And one of the things there, of course, is, is encouraging um, people to go into psychiatry, and that has been phenomenally successful. The Choose Psychiatry campaign started with Simon Wesley. So a 30% increase in number of people and going into psychiatry. You've heard about the Pathfinder scheme that's been immensely successful. I've been involved in the judging panels, and I have to say it's one of the most inspiring couple of days I spend every year picking candidates. It's very hard to pick them. These students coming through are absolutely phenomenal and inspirational. Um, so you've heard about a lot of activity coming through, but there is an element about how it's been really good to bring in other disciplines, but as psychiatrists, we do need to be aware of what is happening in our field. So a few years ago, with uh, the MRC led, but did a review of um, academic training fellowships with NIHR, and it's across all of medicine, so the arrow gives the clue, this is psychiatry here. Um, and this purple bar that's quite big at the end are people doing fellowships, pre-doctoral and doctoral fellowships. Um, and as you see, compared to a lot of disciplines, we're not doing very badly, but compared to some, say, neurology is here, this one here, we're maybe not doing as well as we should. What would be more troubling is when people get their PhD, do they then move into more senior positions? And it has been noted in this report that psychiatry is one of the disciplines that does not seem to be um, gaining the numbers through into leadership roles. So we have a challenge there. And I just want to highlight something we did within the Royal College a few years ago. We did a review of academic faculty, so thank you for those people who I would have bothered here at um, Oxford University, many facilitated through Belinda Lennox, she's an exec. And what I wanted to do was look at that review, Strengthening Academic Psychiatry, which has actually been quite successful in meeting many of its recommendations, but not all of them, and just see what our status was five years on. Had we actually improved the numbers? In terms of um, that's actual number and in terms of um, percentage difference, you can see that actually there's been a slight reduction in the number of profs, but if you actually look at the number of profs compared to senior lecturers coming through, we're about half down. That, that pyramid's the wrong way around to me. We should have a vast number. And this is where the largest reduction in people coming through is. The most of the people who were in here have, were now being readers and on their way up, but it was a very small proportion. Now, the lack of senior lecturers has been highlighted across medicine. So that review from the, led by the MRC has highlighted it. So you will be getting questionnaires and, and um, research into why people aren't transitioning through into more senior positions. 
But within the, what's very noticeable in the Medical Schools Council report was there's been a 24% drop in clinical academics whilst our profession has increased in only 38%. So as we grow as a profession, we're losing the academic input from clinical psychiatrists. Asked by somebody quite senior in, in the system recently, I said, well, what would happen if we didn't have academic psychiatry? I said, where do you think innovation comes from, new evidence? If you don't have us, then there will be no innovations or limited innovations. So I was pleased that the Royal College actually put into its proposals for building on the NHS's five-year forward review that in 10 years' time, we would have an increase in the number of, reverse this sort of decline, we would have an increase of 50% of senior lecturer numbers. So that's an ambitious target, um, but I'm pleased to see that in there. And in addition, that every medical school should have been linked with an academic department of psychiatry. <coughs> that is not the case at the moment in the UK. And even when there are academic departments and medical schools um, successfully sort of promoting psychiatry, the two aren't necessarily linked. So we want to see that happen as well. And this is the latest thing from the um, medical uh, schools review about clinic academic staffing levels. And they have highlighted for the last few years about the decline of psychiatry. But here they have also recommended, rather than looking down, but looking outward, that in terms of parity, coming back to lack of parity, is that the, um, the ref going forward, the decision making, we should be um, on a par, we should be receiving the same amount of money as our fellow clinical medics who may not be aware that a clinical psychiatrist, we attract less money for our university compared to a clinical medic. Um, and clearly that has an impact on how your higher education establishments are going to invest. Why would you invest maybe in mental health and psychiatry if it's not going to bring in as much money in terms of your research? And having seen these recommendations, having thought we had uh, won this battle, it was therefore very disappointing to hear from the, in the ref that they were going to perpetuate this disparity. And so we have written a letter from the Royal College, myself and uh, Wendy Byrne, to uh, Professor Sir Mark Walcourt, explaining that we are disappointed in this and that we urge them to relook at it. So what I would say about academic psychiatry, it is fantastic, I think. You know, I have a lot to be grateful, a lot of people in this audience for what's given a uh, great career, it's given great care to very many people. I think we have made step change uh, improvements in care that we're delivering. But I think as an organization and as a group of individuals, we have to pay attention to these uh, junior psychiatrists coming through, nurture their academic careers, as mine has been by many in this room, in order that we tackle some of these um, translational, these key steps up to senior leadership roles in order to sustain the truly excellent quality of, of research in the UK, um, because without that, clearly a lot of our patients' needs will not be met. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. I think the idea is that we're going to have the presentations and then a general Q&A, but if there's any specific question which relate to the facts, then feel free to ask it, because that might be So thanks. Um, Max, are you going to be the next? Yeah. Okay, so Max Paquet has been referred to already as the winner of a prize, um, extremely prestigious national prize, and he's now going to talk to us, give us five minutes about his interests and how he sees the future. <coughs> okay, so I'm, a, uh, I'm an engineer by background, that means I'm a nerd by training, uh, and I sort of came into psychiatry after that. Um, and uh, as an engineer, probably it's not surprising to most of you that when I think about the future of clinical psychiatry, I think of data and, and big data in particular. And there's really three things that I want to throw in there about big data before we move on to the uh, panel discussion. And the first thing is that big data is not only about big, uh, about big volume. Volume is a major uh, aspect of big data, of course, but it's not the only one. Uh, and big data instead can be defined as any significant innovation compared to current previous studies are on one, at least one of the three dimensions on the screen. So volume is definitely one of them. The velocity, that is the frequency at which we sample data, is another one. And variety, that is the, the, the range of modalities that we use in studies, is yet another one. <coughs> and so, so to illustrate that first point, uh, this is a study that we did in the Department of Psychiatry where we merged data sets from the Oxley trial and the COMET study, uh, where we looked at a relatively moderate number of participants, that is 90, but we looked at uh, brain imaging data alongside uh, experience sampling data 
uh, from a mobile platform wherein participants were reporting their mood every day. Um, and so in terms of variety and velocity, that's a huge uh, data set and a very interesting data set indeed. Uh, and by doing that, what we see is that we can measure mood instability and we can link that to the brain connectivity fingerprints and we can start finding associations along dimensions of mental illness rather than categories. So that's just one illustration of a big data set. It's not necessarily a big volume in terms of number of participants. Another very important uh, aspect of the big data is big volume. And there's, there's, there's uh, scenarios in which big volumes is of the essence. Um, and in particular, when it comes to uh, finding patterns that are very important that are hidden in everyday noise. And so one example of that is if you try to uh, look at the link between uh, moods so or how people feel and behaviors, so what they do with their everyday, uh, in their everyday life. Now, obviously, the choices of everyday activities is driven by a lot of factors. And if you want to even out those factors and look at the impact of mood in particular, you need to have a lot of data. Uh, so big volume in that case is of the essence. What we found in doing that is that um, there was a, a sort of mood homeostatic pattern that emerges. That is, when people feel rather bad, they decide to later on engage in activities that will make them feel better. But when they feel rather good, they then tolerate later on engage in activities that will make them feel worse. But more importantly, this pattern of mood homeostasis is completely lost when patients have, uh, when participants in the study have a past medical history of depression or when they have lower than average mood. And so that's what we showed using two large data sets, one in high income countries and one in low and, and middle income countries as well. And finally, big data spur new collaborations. And that's because if you look at the breadth and depth of data, uh, it's very certain that a, 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 a single group, research group, let alone a single researchers can handle it all. So we need to collaborate with other departments and even with the, re the research community at large to be able to grasp uh, and, and exploit the data to its maximal potential. And one example of that is another research project that I've been involved in, wherein we looked at uh, uh, the genetic predisposition to psychiatric illness uh, by looking at single nucleotide polymorphism and the association between that and uh, structural brain networks. Um, and what we found is that uh, genetic predisposition, predispositions to distinct psychi psychiatric diagnoses lead to a single unique common disruption in brain structural network. And that's quite important in terms of understanding the, the neurobiology of psychiatric illness um, and its transdiagnostic nature. But importantly, again, in that, in that, uh, in that project, uh, we couldn't do that without huge collaborations. The single nucleotide polymorphism that we identified was based on 136 GWAS studies uh, covering five million patients. But that was done very easily because people doing GWAS studies uh, uh, sort of would port all the findings in a GWAS catalog in a very standardized manner. So instead of having to dig into the literature, we could simply download a huge file and, and, and crunch it. Um, and the advanced Im uh, image analysis that we did uh, would have taken five years on a single, even very powerful desktop computer, but we boiled that down to one week by using a huge uh, mega cluster of 14,000 computers uh, and that wouldn't have been possible without the help of computer scientists. So that's where the sort of collaborations that we can, that we can do both in terms of different de uh, departments but also with the rest of the um, uh, uh, research community is very important. So what does that mean for um, uh, budding uh, academic psychiatrists uh, like myself? Well, I think it brings three great needs. The first one is that because there's huge uh, open big data sets out there, we can go from idea to publication much quicker. Uh, the second thing is that because of the breadth and depth of data that's available, uh, we can start answering questions that couldn't possibly be answered before. And that creates some, some great opportunities for research as well. And then thirdly, uh, that means we can collaborate with other departments and learn every day from, from different fields. I think learning every day is probably one of the reasons why we enter research in the first place and certainly why we've been here for the last few days. Thank you. Fantastic. So, Chris Pugh. Chris is an old ally, Oxford Medicine. He can introduce himself and he's kept his powder dry. So, I don't know what he's going to talk about. Thanks, Guy. Hi. Um, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I haven't prepared any slides because it provides flexibility in what I'm about to say. Uh, the risk is that I won't say anything meaningful and will dry up at some point, but I hope not. Um, so anniversaries always make us look backwards, and I'm going to do that very briefly before looking forward, because 1968 was an important year in my life. It was the year that, despite having two academics as my parents, I thought that being a student would be rather fun. 
to the older people in the audience, they'll realize why, because we spent our summer holiday in Paris in the heat of August 1968. I was 11. I was terribly impressed by what the students were up to. I was terribly excited by the riot police, and I smelled CS gas for the first time. <laughs> um, I, I then, uh, like many others here, came to the medical school um, in 1975. I was a clinic, uh, pre clinical contemporary at Eleanor and a clinical contemporary at Paul Harrison's. That tells you it took me rather a long time to get through the medical school. I enjoyed my time here, and I think enjoyment is one of the things that I hope uh, our successes in academic medicine will, will have. Um, I now turn to those successes because the future is really in their hands, and I think the responsibility of people like myself with gray hair, most of it still there, is to make sure that they're prepared for that future and can look forward to a great time. I, I have the great privilege of being director of the Clinical Academic Graduate School at the moment, and our strategy is very simple in concept. We aim for high quality recruitment, we aim to run a high quality program, and we hope for a high quality outflow, academically, all linked to excellent clinical training. Of course, that's very easy to say. It's much harder to achieve. And I acknowledge there are significant ascertainment biases in what we're doing, because the people we choose to select and recruit stay with us for two, three, four, five, and longer years. Those who we don't shortlist, and I look at carefully at Dr. Fiona here, um, often disappear from our purview. And we never do any control experiments on those, those processes. Uh, and I think maybe, maybe we should. So um, that, that's our strategy. Um, we've talked, I've talked briefly about recruitment and its risks. I, I want to talk briefly about what I mean by a high quality pro program, and I think that is exemplified in, in psychiatry, but we shouldn't be complacent. I think strengths are, are obvious. I think an outlook that is interdisciplinary is really, really important, and that's particularly important in exciting areas like your, your sorts of brain science. We've heard from Max about some aspects of that, but the links into psychology, the links into imaging, neuropharmacology, neurogenetics, neuroimmunology are all there and, and must be built on. And, and to build on those, we need flexibility, because the one-fits-all approach to training just doesn't work if you have some people who want to do things one way and other people who have a perfectly good justification for them doing it another way. And one of the things I value in UCAX is the relationships we have with the clinical trainers, the heads of school, training program directors, etc., that allow us to negotiate that sort of flexibility, um, sometimes for our, our trainees. Um, the other thing which I think is important is outflow. You know, any journey is about the journey, but it's also a little bit about the destination. And one of the things that I think is a paradox at the moment is where we're told that people can't fill academic posts. And we're told that one of the disincentives for going into an academic career is there are no de destination posts to go to. And I think we're, we're failing there somehow in matching expectations to realities. And then we need to do a little bit more in terms of expectation management. But we also probably, if we build a new NIHR pipeline from cradle to grave or whatever it is, um, need to think about the destination posts. The medical schools are expanding, there are new medical schools, and yet the number of clinical academics doesn't really change very much. <coughs> the other thing we need to think about in terms of outflow is, is the part that we play in a national and an international community. And there are quite a lot of us in this room who came to Oxford and have stayed. Um, it's rather a nice place, isn't it? But actually, we have a responsibility to send the messages outwards from here um, to other parts of, of the country and the globe. And in that regard, I just want to mention one, one international thing which some in the audience may know, not know about, but the excitement of a new academic link to the Mayo Clinic in, in uh, the United States. And I hope that we can build on that uh, both in psychiatry and in other, other aspects of medicine. And then finally, we've heard from the Royal College of Psychiatry, but um, I, I think it's also important that we think uh, beyond the, the boundaries of, uh, and I'm not suggesting we don't, but beyond the boundaries of individual Royal Colleges, 
And I think it's important to just reflect on what the Academy of Medical Sciences, for example, is trying to do with the INSPIRE program to promote academic careers for medical students, things like the SUSTAIN program to uh, encourage uh, very able women to remain in their academic careers uh, and uh, other such uh, adventures. Um, so I'm not going to carry on. I've probably said more than I should. Um, but I look forward to a vibrant discussion and I look forward to being challenged in some of the ideas I put forward because that's the way we improve them. Thank you. So I was wondering, Max, what you see uh, uh, for the role of big data in psychiatry, uh, the role of industry in, in um, that work, whether uh, we need to be um, speaking to uh, uh, tech companies such as you know, DeepMind or, or Facebook, who obviously, I mean, it's great to be able to collaborate with computer science departments, but the kind of computational power that's available uh, and the skill set that's available in those companies is, is uh, you know, an order of magnitude better than is even available in university departments these days. Um, and kind of more broadly to the rest of, of the um, kind of panel, uh, what uh, role you see um, the training in kind of quantitative skill sets uh, plays in, in the training of, of psychiatrists more broadly in, in general? Um, thank you. Um, well, I think collaborating with anyone who can bring something to psychiatry is a good idea. Uh, so if it's, if it's a company or an office, something that we should uh, refrain from collaborating with them. Uh, certainly can bring a lot of computational power and skills and data. Uh, and so there's, there's, there's some massive opportunity to, uh, uh, to take. Uh, I think it all sort of links as well, maybe implicitly in what you were asking about uh, questions such as confidentiality, privacy, and, and a whole bunch of issues that have been raised in the last couple of years. Um, and I think that's probably something that academics should focus on um, and try to address or find solutions for. And there are already solutions uh, out there for other fields, and I think that we should try to uh, take them and implement them in psychiatry to protect the privacy of, of, of uh, patients or participants' data when we uh, look at those massive data sets, because the unicity of, of, of people in those massive data sets means that their privacy cannot be simply addressed by anonymizing their uh, username, for instance. Uh, just to comment on, on the training, so um, many of you may be aware the Royal College of Psychiatrists a few years ago got funding from the Academy of Welcome to really promote neuroscience and teaching and all the technologies and techniques as well as you know interpretation data. Which so there is a move in it. And um, even I think the college has something like 144 committees. We actually managed to change an exam question in a matter of weeks rather than a year, which uh, was quite um, good. Um, but I do, I do think it is a slow process at the moment. What's been interesting is that we, you know, yourself, with different backgrounds coming to psychiatry. Psychiatry, I think, has always had a reputation for taking uh, people with various career paths, which I think is good. We mustn't lose that, and I think that has been slightly lost by the, um, uh, the conveyor belt of training. But I, uh, we, so we, we must still accept people into the path that can step off the conveyor belt when they need to and come back, and that still is an issue. I think we still need to think with NHR and make careers more flexible. Um, but I think the training aspect, I think the college is really starting to get to grips with it. What it challenged was actually the trainers, so the people who just consulted, because they felt they didn't have the knowledge. And so actually it's been really important to support them and deliver the training to the trainees, actually. So we've missed out a good 10, 20 years. So um, they're trying to do a lot more work supporting them as well. So I think collaboration is key, and I don't think it matters who you collaborate with, so long as they're the best that you can work with. And I think we have all sorts of concerns about confidentiality, we have concerns about being taken over by other people, get to the post and this and the other. I think 
think on the whole you're getting much more from collaboration than you do from trying to work in a silo, and, and I thoroughly encourage that. And I think we've heard from Mike and others about the benefits of collaboration between physical and, 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 and mental health, uh, and you know, there should be no, no limits to that. In, in terms of quantitative skills, I, I think they are vital. I, I can't remember who it was. Was it Rutherford or somebody else who said, if you can measure it, you can study it? Um, you know, apologies for my counting. Okay, for my ignorance, I'm glad to be. I knew I'd be informed by coming here. Um, but you know, actually, on the whole, medics are not terribly good with quantitative skills. Uh, they're not as geeky as, as people think they are. Uh, and we're probably behind the curve in, in a lot of that, that stuff. Uh, and I don't see any reason why you can't be good at quantitative skills and compassionate. Um, and I think it's something that you know, we should all be addressing. The, the real tragedy is that people in this country lose their quantitative skills before they've finished at school. And they don't really carry that on through. But I think those of us who want to make a success of academic careers um, you know, have to invest more in that direction. It's a slight consolation to me in my 60s that I probably have most of my academic career now and I don't have to go and learn how to program. Um, but I would encourage everybody younger than me to go and do so as I do my two children in their 20s. They ignore me on that device as I'm so much else. Awesome. Power to their spirit. Okay, so learn how to code, isn't that the slogan? Mike. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, because. Yeah. Um, so we live in the greatest of times. I mean, when, when Michael Gelder started the department, I wasn't there, um, but psychiatry was not as universally, and psychology, universally accepted, and mental health is the rage. This is boom time. We have a product that's selling like hotcakes everywhere. How are we going to make enough product? Thanks. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, four ideas gratefully accepted. Um, I, I mean, I, I highlighted the decline. And I, the reason I just say it is that I think it, there are lots of factors to it. I think all of academic medicine is, is there's a step down at that senior lecture level. So psychiatry is not unusual, but we have a bigger step down than some. But I do think there's something about supporting juniors it, the, as you said, the head of medical sciences, one of my team, got one of their small starter grants. And the first line was, it was lovely to get an application for psychiatry. Um, so I think out there, people are wanting us to be more involved. But we, I think a lot of the, my experience of mentoring quite a few ACFs, establishing the ACF and ACL program at Imperial, was it was a huge amount of work to get the clinical rotation to understand. They were very supportive. I think Oxford, you're, you're lucky. You've all, to me, I've been trained here, there was always that you know, cross but unfortunately, the majority of trusts they see researchers that somebody else does, I think it has no relevance to them. So I think we've still got to overcome that grassroots stuff. There is still huge areas of the UK that have no academic psychiatrists that is easily identifiable for a medical student at medical school. Um, I thought a quick and easy thing would be just go on everybody's website at medical school to find out who was the key psychiatrist, head of psychiatry. A whole weekend went by, it was often quite hard to find. We know two places that were shut down when a new dean came in, weren't going to invest in psychiatry anymore. Those have never recovered. So I think there's a, there's a multiple element. I think all the focus is on supporting the juniors to come through, that it is challenging to career. We do live from grant to grant. Um, the expectations of what the career is actually like, but you know, it, it is immensely rewarding. I think from a Royal College perspective, what we're trying to do is offer small grants. We're trying to get approval from trustees to spend money slightly differently at the moment. Um, we have, since I've been chair, we've created four, hopefully another three PhD studentships along the way, two jointly with the MRC, that's got to be good. So that's a, you know, a few more people all coming through. So there are little things we are doing, but I do think the bigger picture is this lack of parity at REF, because I think that has a very strategic view about how institutions view their psychiatrists. And, and that's a much higher level stuff than certainly mine, but I'm trying to at least raise it and agitate, as I know others are here as well. I'm delighted to comment. I mean, I think lucky you to be in the spotlight and in so much demand. Um, how you deal with it um, is going to involve a lot of work. Um, it is recognised. 
So I, I'm just in the middle of preparing the Oxford bid to NIHR for competition posts for ACFs and CLs. Um, psychiatry is the only one that specialty, not that it's one specialty, but the only academic area that can actually bid in every single NIHR theme at the moment. There's a theme on mental health, there's a theme on dementia, you can get a toe in the water there. Uh, there's a theme on acute care, there's a theme on complex care, chronic disease and the elderly. Uh, there's a medical education theme which anybody can obviously uh, bid on. And then in an environment like this, there's no shortage of, of interest in platform science and therapeutics and clinical pharmacology. Uh, as a mere nephrologist, I, I can't compete at all. Um, and you, you know, I, I actually, 1968 is when the Oxford Kidney Unit was uh, founded. You, you've done rather better than we have. Um, I, I still have my clinical office in a porter cabin that was put up in 1968. I, it's a room that's about 10 foot square and I share it with... Uh, Chris, I'm really, really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I came here for a bit of therapy, Mike. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, enough of that. But I, you know, I, think, I think the future is, is bright. I think it's great that there are the reports. I think there's a lot of goodwill. Um, and I think we need to work on it, on it together. And, um, grateful Gates for being contributing to, to that component of the bid that is psychiatry. Just, just a, maybe a small thing. Um, I think I was shocked when I arrived in medicine that it was, there was a recruitment crisis in psychiatry and it was difficult to recruit people because my experience from before was that it was very easy to recruit any engineer to do any psychiatric project on neuroimaging or otherwise. <coughs> um, so it's something that fascinates a lot of people, and surprisingly, it, it's only starting to fascinate a lot of medical doctors as well. Um, not, that it, not that it didn't fascinate any doctors before, but it's starting to, to grow. And I think we can also leverage that aspect of the workforce, that is, um, psychologists, neuroscientists, engineers, computer scientists, that, that all have a, an immense interest in mental illness and psychiatry. So any other any other questions? Any other comments? Maybe maybe we could return to this issue of, of stigma, uh, which uh, Dave Pierre alluded to, and uh, and yesterday that the, the comment was made uh, by the age of science of psychiatry that the battle to kind of improve uh, stigma was to some extent won by deforming our ideas of what psychiatric disorders were to fit the general population's perception, which is a victory in one way, but it's a pyrrhic victory because it actually doesn't do justice to the true severity and challenge of people with severe mental disorder. I wonder whether what your perceptions of that were from the college on the one hand and then as kind of people standing a little outside this on the other. Yeah, this I mean, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Royal College at all, and I alluded to the bit of stigma reading in the Sunday paper about opioid epidemic crisis. And so I work in addiction, which um, has actually now been kicked out of the NHS pretty much. Um, and, uh, you know, there it's, it's a real difficulty. Um, I think we still have a lot of work to do with that. And I think the complexity of the issues, I think if you... It's interesting, the debate about trauma recently, because of pretty much all of my patients, my clients that I, which I use in the service now, um, have you know have had the history of trauma. And until you mention the drug misuse, people are very sympathetic. And as soon as you mention that, it's written off. And as some politician said, you know, nobody ever comes up to me in the street during elections and asks me to put more money into treating addicts. Um, and I think, therefore, you know, the, the, we still have immense challenges to get people to conceptualise um, that a lot of these people have issues often going back to childhood that um, they're just looking at ways to um, make themselves able to function day to day, in addition to all the other disorders which have a neurodevelopmental um, link or immunotherapy, immunology link that um, Belinda described earlier. I am still distressed to hear organic versus functional being mentioned, particularly when a neurologist said, um, we, we deal with the organic, you deal with the functional. I could say the two psychiatrists on either side of you all week kind of got ready to counter that, because I think that perpetuates and is still um, incorrect. I saw recently a doctor write, as usual, psychiatry ran ahead with medications, the disorders before understanding them. And I thought, actually, that applies to most events that we don't often understand. So I think there's a lot to be done still within our profession, sadly. The parity was mentioned. Um, 
I give you a couple of examples. I'm still dismayed by that. But I, I do think things have changed. I mean, the public are more interested, I guess, when I say I'm a psychiatrist, that, you know, that people don't back off anymore. They ask questions, you know, what do I do? I think that has shifted dramatically. Um, I think we need to continue taking on some of the vitriol that's in the media. Um, I, you know, my, as many of you may know, my, I've worked with David now for 20 years and I've watched witnesses get close to watching the mic shop. So <coughs> having over the weekend in the paper, we have to continue taking on. But there's just a huge amount of courage and I have two colleagues who've really had to go to the ground recently and that is awful because we should be al allowing to have this academic debate to address some of the issues without being um, pretty much handed into our homes. I started uh, my preclinical career at Oxford when it, we were being bombed. So, um, you know, I, we were given an emergency because people were trying to stop us doing preclinical, and it almost feels sometimes we have, unfortunately haven't got quite that far, although I know some people have had death threats. And I just don't understand the place of that. We should be allowed to have these debates. We should be out in the public domain. Um, and I hope, you know, there are enough people continue with that, you know, courage to take on the debate. Yeah. I, I mean, stigma is really difficult to deal with, but I, I guess normalization is one of the routes to dealing with stigma. Uh, and if a cost of normalization is to, to broaden the spectrum, what, what is normality? We're, we're all somewhere on the spectrum, and, and maybe the extremes of that are, are, are dramatic. But I, I would have thought that that was a, a sensible way to go, to, to broaden um, what, what is psychiatric illness, what is psychological disease, what is the, the, the spectrum of normality. And, and that in no way demeans the extremes of it, but, but I think that is a, a route to stigmatization. I think the great thing is we're talking about it, though. Um, you know, we started with the separation of, of the Warnford out in, in the, the fields of Headington up the hill, where I understand the Anglo-Saxons lived to get the clear air. Um, you know, the, the, the concept of an asylum being out miles away from, from where who normal lives and so on is, is now outmoded. And, and we should celebrate that. And I think in celebrating that, we will move towards destigmatization. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know Values. I think it's. Uh, I, I was unaware. I have to say uh, that the ref was was detrimental to people in, in mental health psychiatry. Um, I can see no justification for that. Um, I suppose from the prejudice to view of somebody who uh, I, I don't think it exists anymore, but had a mental health officer protection and retirement five years earlier, and this, that, and the other. You know, maybe we look out of out of windows in one direction and see what we want to see, and we don't look through windows in the other direction and see what's visible to others. Um, so I think I'll shut up before I say anything more controversial, um, and I encourage Max to say something uh, uplifting about the future, um, where it will all be destigmatized and the quality will still allow some of us to excel, or some of you to excel. I think I uh, maybe adding something on something that's close to home in terms of stigma. There's also the stigma of psychiatrists that's well towards psychiatrists themselves rather than towards patients. Um, which is something that we, most of us would have encountered at some stage of the career. Um, so I sort of knew from during the placement that Kate's not leading in psychiatry that I want to do the psychiatry. Uh, but for perhaps a year, um, when people were asking what do you want to do, I, I would always say, well, psychiatry or neurology. And people would jump to neurology and say, oh, yeah, neurology is great. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I started, when I started my foundation post, I started to say I want to do psychiatry because that's clearly what I want to do. Um, and it's quite interesting because then you start engaging in discussions and, and you get a whole bunch of comments and, and you know, some, some pleading, some not so, not so much. Um, but it's good because then you, you can start combating uh, the stigma on the ground as well. Uh, and in, you know, when you hear things like, oh, why do you want to do psychiatry? You can just try to explain and you can, you can debate those, those, those reasons. And uh, when, you, when you hear stigma, just you're too smart to do psychiatry, to go, why? And, and then you start Engaging those discussions, and say, well, do you think do you think psychiatry doesn't need doesn't need smart people? And they say, well, sure, they do. And then they realize they they they're contradictions, and I think that's one way of fighting stigma uh, as a doctor.
Thanks, Max. We're glad you're here. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's been a longish day, and yesterday was a very long day. So, uh, is there any further point or question people would like to make at this point? Go and go and go on. Mike. I hate to ask a second question, but. Is it a question? That's yes. A <laughs> this is the 50th anniversary. Come the 100th anniversary, some of us may not be here. But for those of us that are, what will the University Department of Psychiatry, not necessarily the building, what will the activity look like? I think John's going to answer that question. Oh, good. But, um, <laughs> but, but obviously, we'll, we'll throw it open to the panel because uh, their imaginations may be I stimulating. Actually, only Max is yeah, going to be you. here. So, <laughs> 50, yeah, even you are going to have to do well. But you should, <laughs> you should, you should be here. I mean, yeah, you may, yeah, you'll get that, well, you won't get that double retirement dose that Chris was alluding to, I'm afraid, because that's long gone. Well, it's difficult to say. I don't think that because I'm young, I'm better positioned to answer questions. Probably, probably the other way around. Uh, I'm just hoping that we carry on doing the great work that's been done for the past 50 years and improving on that, uh, gaining more evidence, getting more treatments. There's been uh, a huge number of very inspiring talks over the last two days on, on great and, and diverse avenues of, of, of new treatments to uh, target specific aspects of mental illness. And I think we can carry on doing that and finding markers and, and using data alongside models and, and, uh, and uh, building on the great theory that's been uh, uh, demonstrated its effects so far. So that's what I see for the future. Thank you very much. So I think, I think probably, does anyone want to say anything else? I mean, or Mike a third? I mean, it's a free, it's a free market in ideas. Yeah, okay. Okay, well. Okay. Okay. So I'll say thank you very much to our speakers, our panel. Uh, it was great to have you all three. Thank you very much for coming for so far. Great to see you again. So I'm going to take. I'm just going to take, take my opportunity to just introduce John Geddes, who's probably known to some of you. And I just want to express my gratitude, John, for the fantastic work you've done. It was a a real privilege to hand on to someone who I knew was going to do an amazing job, and that's what you've done. Uh, and we're going to look ahead to 50 years of uh, glory. And uh, I wish you the sort of longevity that will take you all the way there. So. Um, you're going to wind up the yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Guy. So I'm just going to finish off, but um, what are what an amazing couple of days. And uh, when we were planning this, it would get anxious. Well, I do. Um, uh, you know, how to look and how to show. And particular thanks to uh, Mark and uh, Andre there for the uh, massive coverage. I don't know if we can report statistics on our outreach at some point. I mean, you might not have it to handle that. Yeah, I'll get it ready. Yeah. Um, but this has been a global event. Um, and, and indeed, that's a bit of a, bit of a message, really. Because when, when we started, we were going to focus on research and education outputs and impacts rather than things like infrastructure. And development and celebrate some of the achievements of the last 50 years, but also plan for the future. And I think we've, we've achieved that. I've, um, there's a lot to celebrate. Fantastic bomb. It's an enormous privilege to work here and also to lead this bomb. Um, and we've also looked at planning for the future. And this is this amazing situation we're in. I mean, look at that a little bit as we go on. Um, and we've, we've, over, we've looked at these massive research outputs and impacts that we've had, but also this afternoon looked at the importance of teaching and also just how well we do. Um, and also this really important interface with the clinical service delivery um, and also the population level, you know, things like I am, things like the development of psychological medicine service. A um, study that came out from NQ just a couple of weeks ago where they identified the um, the limited research funding available for mental health compared to 
other areas, notably uh, cancer at the top there. Um, and obviously the, the big issue here is the amount that actually comes from um, donations, charities, etc., which is where we, we don't have a lot. But it, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because one of the critical things we've identified, particularly this afternoon, just isn't that there isn't enough funding, because in actual fact we've also seen that there's been a huge increase in funding for research. But as Michael pointed out, I think, our, our issue is about bandwidth, uh, about training, and about having the capacity to make the most of this as it comes through. And I think for a place like Oxford, this is, this is really interesting because um, as Anne was talking about, when you look around the UK, we're really lucky here, we're fortunate, we've built a lot on what is now a really huge department of psychiatry because a lot of centres and medical schools simply don't have any departments of psychiatry at all. But also, as, as you know, doing research in this area is complicated. Uh, it's not something that is best necessarily left to psychiatrists. You need clinical academic psychiatrists. But just as Guy, as Emily pointed out, brought non clinicians, trans what we call translational psychiatrists, into the department, it's critically important that we have uh, full engagement with scientists uh, to do the most powerful research we can. And of course, we saw from George Pickering's report back in 1960 that that was always the bedrock of this department of psychiatry was the real strengths of Oxford biomedicine, and we put that uh, goes beyond biomedicine, all the way into the humanities and beyond. The, the other thing that people might have seen in this um, is that we came top in terms of the amount of research funding that goes into mental health research. I have to say that's a statistic, I just don't know where they got that from, but there isn't an analogy. <laughs> Uh, and I know we get a reasonable amount of funding, but I didn't realize we came uh, to the top. And I think actually that does depend a little bit on how you cut the cake. Because I'm a little bit uncertain we really get as much as King's College plus Sapland and Lord's League combined. And even if you add those together, we still do better than that. So I, I think talking to Niall yesterday, who has some insight into the methodology, it's because it depends on how you count the amount of preclinical neuroscience work that goes on in Keir's department and across the other departments of, of Oxford. But clearly, we increasingly find, um, you know, because it is complex research to do, you need a certain amount of infrastructure, a certain amount of kit. Look at just how important it has been to develop things like the Oxford Centre for Human Brain Activity at the, uh, the Warnford site, where this is a real inspiration to research because it gives proximal access to really cutting edge infrastructure and it brings more funding in. Um, so I will get somewhere because you know at the moment there's a bandwidth problem. We're doing okay for funding. We need to see that grow and there is more funding coming. So actually my figure is on the bandwidth problem as being our critical uh, issue. Um, now, we weren't going to start off talking about infrastructure, but I think I do have to point my finger to one amazing opportunity that we have in Oxford, and that is this, um, what Chris was talking about, this, and um, Michael was this hospital up on the hill in the countryside. And of course, it was in the countryside, that's the Warnford Hospital, which there it is, sort of from the early years of the century. Uh, Guy, actually, that was uh, taken by Guy Goodwin out of his office window, the cricket match. <laughs> Just before he had to before the war, <laughs> because what happened after that was that the hospital built um, the new LSM unit on there. So I inherited a rather different view from a bucolic uh, country. But this this is the hospital that was built, uh, founded in 1821. Um, the foundation stone laid on the 27th of August, initially funded by the university. It was actually uh, Trinity College which uh, kicked off the whole thing. It's renamed the Warnford Lunatic Asylum and then uh, lastly the Warnford uh, Asylum and then the Warnford Hospital. And it's uh, an amazing site, 21 and a half acres. Um, there it is. Uh, Noel provided me this when he was um, in a hot air balloon <laughs> over the Warnford Hospital. Sometimes when you wonder where Noel is, <laughs> just <laughs> Um, he'll be up there. Noel, are you here at the moment? Or? No, he's 
Do you know where he is? <laughs> <laughs> nice sight. Well, you can see down there what's my top uh, right-hand corner, the sort of collection of green buildings. There's this remarkable development because the geography of Oxford is um, working for us at the moment because we are one of the, uh, we are the bottom left red point there, which is the Warnford Hospital, and the John Radcliffe is the top red dot there. And then we've got the Knock and the Churchill Hospital. So we've got this amazing uh, congregation of hospitals in Headington, which gives us an amazing opportunity. And then even when we talk about down the hill and all the Greek clinical departments, they really are only a mile away, so down there to the uh, left. Um, and this is what happens if you map the various centres, institutes, and external funding onto that map of Oxford, you get uh, an astonishing uh, resource of external investment and centres of excellence. This is just the site of the Old Road campus, and when, when I came here in, in 95, most of that was, the, the, I think the Oxford um, District Health Authority was based there, but there's very little else actually. <coughs> Muir Gray was often to be found down there. Um, it is now completely full because the Welcome Pen uh, Centre for Human Genetics was built in 1999, Richard Dole building 2005, Old Road Campus Research Building. 2008, I could go on, um, and, um, but I won't, and it's almost full, we're just currently building the Institute for Development and Regenerative Medicine and Vaccine <coughs> Immunology and Infections, and uh, I, I met uh, a donor yesterday in the Bioescalator, which is an amazing building on there. So that site's full, uh, but it is just at the bottom of the garden from the Warren <coughs> Hospital. There is probably nowhere else on the planet where people are trying to do mental health related research with that amount of expertise within five minutes walk. And that's an opportunity that we can't afford to squander. Um, so we are going to build a new hospital now. Uh, it'll be a new academic base, not just for psychiatry, but for colleagues from experimental psychology and from uh, neurology, particularly the um, colleagues from the, the neuroimaging community. It'll have embedded commercial partners, uh, and, if, and within the Warnford will be the Medical Sciences HQ. So one solution to having separation between medicine and uh, the rest of medicine and the brain will be actually to move the centre of Oxford Medicine onto the Warnford site. You can see as that, uh, particularly the Old Road campus, becomes the centre of the activity for the University Medical Sciences Division, it makes a lot of sense. Already Gavin spends a lot of his time in the uh, Richard Dole building, um, because that's where his colleagues increasingly are. Uh, within mental health, we've got these amazing scientific pipelines. Um, at the same time as we're developing the Warnford site, um, although it was unfortunate when Tinbergen was found to have asbestos, it has provided a wonderful opportunity to develop it, and Keir and her colleagues are driving that along just as we've got the uh, Sherrington and the HP. Development. So all of this is beginning to give us the most remarkable uh, scientific infrastructure. And then we've got uh, this integrated leadership across Oxford that brings together the University, Oxford University Hospitals, Oxford Health, NHS Foundation Trust, and Oxford Brooks that so far have made wonderfully constructive um, decisions about uh, how to engage with external funding strategically. That's really important for us. Um, we work with two hospitals, at least two hospitals within Oxford, Oxford University Hospitals and Oxford Health NHS Foundation Trust. And that uh, always has been the case and obviously has to continue to be the case. So our plan is simple. Um, it is that we keep having great ideas um, because, as everyone knows, that's the route to doing great science. Um, we've already heard about the importance of collaboration, and I've stressed, I think, that we simply cannot expect psychiatrists to do it all themselves. But we do need to uh, link in and collaborate with those wonderful scientists and others across Oxford and beyond. And collaboration isn't always easy. I mean, in some ways, it's easy to sit in your office and put your head down and focus on what's in front of you and try to think it out, but it's nearly always the wrong thing to do. Um, so I would urge everyone to collaborate widely and uh, err on the side of excess uh, rather than otherwise. This, this bit's really important as an academic. 
you have to learn to absolutely thrive on rejection. Um, because you're going to get rejected a lot. I, I don't know of any other area of uh, mental, uh, of, of human activity where one can fail so often. <laughs> you look at the uh, success and failure rates on grants, you, you know, you, you're, you're, you're not going to win most of the time, and, and you just have to accept that. So you, it, it is so important to learn from failures and success, but also support each other. When we do that, you know, we all fail. Um, and we all learn a huge amount from it. And I, I still think it's one of the most important lessons and skills that you have is the ability to turn around in the face of rejection and to reuse it and to move on and, and to just make something better. Um, it's really important as we start developing the one foot plan to keep growing, and that's growing scientifically because. The science has to grow, you know, we've heard about from Max the, the, the future about the importance of big data and the science and the data and the problems just get bigger and bigger, so we need to improve our science and keep growing. We, we need to keep growing physically. The department has doubled uh, in terms of its research income over the last 10 years. It needs to keep growing because what I don't want to do is to move the department into a brand new place and find that we still have got to fill it. You know, so we've, we've got to drive up the income. And the only way we're going to really create critical mass for creating clinical scientists, the translational scientists of the future, is by growing uh, them ourselves. Because as we've heard from Anne, we're one of the few centers that can actually do that. Most places simply don't have the capacity to do it. However, uh, we are not in competition most of the time unless we're forced to organizations like the Wolfson, for example. We are not in competition most of the time, and there is an outbreak of collaboration occurring within mental health active states across the UK and beyond, actually, because when you've got limited capacity in the system, you have to be efficient and work together. In September 2018, we created the Mental Health Translational Research and Collaboration, and this includes all these sites, uh, those with biomedical research centres uh, that have mental health themes and those without, um, those that have uh, strong histories and academic leadership, including base centres in England, uh, which is covered by the NHR, so that's where you would normally get the TLC from, but from uh, outside uh, the English border, so that's into the Gulf nations of Scotland and Cardiff. This is going to be really important because none of us has all the available infrastructural skills, and by using this TRC collaboratively, we uh, can tell a really wonderful tale to the funders as they increase the funding coming in about how we will use it, but it does again require collaboration. Uh, but I think that is the way that people are working at the moment. So, I'm not going to carry on for too long, uh, almost finished. We started off with thanks, and I just want to reiterate those thanks to the patients and participants in our studies, to our partners, uh, particularly those in the NHS, and to our major funders, and obviously we get funding from a lot of places, but these are the big three uh, that we've heard from, and we've heard just how important, for example, welcome funding has been to the department over the years. I heard that from John Williams, and we need to look at the department and our impact, particularly in the area of psychological therapists, to see just how critically important that has been. And more recently, the NIHR, we've really started focusing in NIHR funding for some of the critical um, infrastructure. And I will finish again by just thanking so much the um, people who put together the programme, uh, the academic programme, so that's uh, Daniel, Sina, Catherine, and Kate, but also um, the, the people who helped make it work so well, I think, in terms of the organization of the day. So that's Moira and Elizabeth Sharon. And Katie, of course, who's masterminded all the, um, the, the publicity and the communication strategy around it. Um, and we work very closely with the mental health, so that's Andre and Mark. And I don't know if you've got the figures for us about what kind of global impact we've had. <laughs> yeah, so um, anything over 10 million impressions is really good a conference of this size. Uh, we've got 35 million impressions over the two days. Yesterday was much more um, engaging than today. <laughs> Sorry, but you know, the figures can't lie. 
Um, I big think data. Yeah, I, I think people online are more interested in psychotherapy than they are in some of the stuff that's been discussed today. But the numbers are really, really good. Uh, 553 people have sent 2,500 tweets. That's, yeah, amazing for an event like this, of this size. So thanks very much, and thanks again. So I know we've got a lot of material that we'll be able to use for, for podcasts and for videos and everything else. And I've just been completely blown away, actually, by the, the, the skill with which you've kind of in real time okay. added value to what we've been talking about here. And so we'll be looking forward to working with you to, to maximise the impact on that. And on that note, so again, thanks to everyone for speaking with us over the couple of days. Although I think it's been pretty easy. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much.